Hey, okay, AP European History students. So throughout the course of this course, we have talked about many great intellectual thinkers throughout European history, going all the way back to the humanists of the Renaissance, through the philosophes of the Enlightenment, through the thinkers that came along after Darwin, guys like Nietzsche and Freud, who looked at the more animalistic side of ourselves. We now reach the final group of philosophers that we talk about through this course. And those are the existentialists that came out of the Second World War. Now, existentialism didn't come out of World War II per se. It was really being developed in the 1930s and even a little before, you could argue. But certainly, World War II made existentialism very popular. So we will learn the definition of existentialism. And there are three primary existentialist that I like to talk about, but I want to add a fourth one here. And this is somebody who I'm going to start with. I very rarely mention Viktor Frankl when, um, when I do my existentialism lecture, but I just decided to throw him in this year. So uh, Viktor Frankl can be considered an existentialist. His primary work, his most famous work, which came out in 1946 right after World War II, is called Man's Search for Meaning. And, you know, I just thought I'd throw this one in because this is a very popular book. It is still a best-selling book today. It is a book that I'm willing to bet that some of you will read at some point in time in your life. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychoanalyst. Uh, he was a Freudian psychotherapist. And he was working on his doctoral thesis when the Nazis came to power. He was captured and sent to a death camp. And as a psychologist who found himself in Auschwitz, he dedicated himself to survival. And as a psychotherapist, he decided to employ the tools of his trade to understand how people could survive the worst possible situation. He started taking notes. These would be notes that he would take on very small scraps of paper that he would have to keep hidden. And he was observing human behavior among the prisoners in Auschwitz. He was trying to discern who has committed themselves to surviving this horrible ordeal and who is giving up, who is letting themselves die. And what he discovered was rather interesting. For himself, by dedicating himself to this particular task, in this worst of all situations, he was giving himself a reason to live. He had essentially given himself a job. And his job was to come up with a theory for how to survive the worst possible situation. And that, coincidentally, was the answer. Even in this worst of all possible situations, he'd given his life meaning. So... This is a book that a lot of people tend to read because we all go through difficult times in life, but certainly nothing that we go through is ever as bad as being a prisoner in Auschwitz. And I think that's why a lot of people gravitate to this book. Viktor Frankl is an incredible observer. He is a very eloquent, meaningful writer. He's a great writer. And people turn to this book to find meaning in their own life. And the central thesis of this book is... In order to survive anything, you have to find meaning in your suffering. So, no matter how bad things are, can you commit yourself to finding out what the purpose of your suffering is for? And if you can find, out, find a purpose in your suffering, then that particular hardship that you're going through contains less suffering. It's in fact a learning experience. So that's Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning. Again, a book I think probably some of you will read at some point in time in your life. It's a very short book. It's pretty easy to get through. And it's very powerful. It's very, very eloquent. And Viktor Frankl is sometimes considered to be an existentialist. All right. Most of the existentialists came out of Paris, France in the 1940s and 1950s in the post-war world. Paris, France had a very vibrant cultural scene after World War II. There had been a lot of physical destruction uh, to France. Certainly France was dealing with a lot of the emotional aftermath of World War II, especially 
since some of the French people had been collaborators with the Nazis, others had uh, been a passive part of the resistance or an active part of the resistance. And so there were, there were a lot of questions about ethics and morality and what you do and what's, what, what's right and wrong during wartime. And if you were a Nazi collaborator, well, now how do you live the rest of your life? It was a period of time in Paris, France, where there, was a lot of, there were a lot of rich philosophical discussions. And let's remember, this is Paris, France. France has a long history of philosophy, of the arts, of that salon culture that developed in the 18th century. And really, this is just a continuation of all of this. The image that you're looking at here was a very common scene in France in the 1940s and 1950s. The cafes. The cafes in Paris, France in the, post, in, in, in the post-war era, 40s and 50s, this was a place where people would gravitate to, especially young people. You'd go there, you'd sit down, you would drink a beer or a coffee, and you would stay there for hours. You'd eat a little something here and there, but this was not just a place you'd go and you'd sit down and do a little work and get up and leave in half an hour. This is a place where you'd spend. This is a place where you'd probably spend a couple of hours, maybe even a half day, maybe even a whole day. Paris was like that. Now, one of the reasons why you'd hang out in the cafes was very practical. Uh, they had heat, and a lot of places, a lot of apartments in Paris at the time did not have heat. So people would go there to do their work and to hang out, and it was just an exciting place to be. Now, another reason why they were excited, why they were exciting places to be, was ex specifically this particular cafe, Odu Mago, and the cafe across the street, Le Fleur is that this is where, these, these were two cafes in a, a, in a neighborhood in Paris called the Saint-Germain-du-Pré neighborhood, where the writers would hang out, where the philosophers would hang out. So you might be able to go there, hang out, you know, read your book, write in a journal, hang out with your friends, argue and debate, and then maybe a famous philosopher would walk in and potentially you would have the opportunity to interact with this, with this great philosopher. Yeah, so these are the two cafes. They're both still uh, there today. This is this one's called Odu Mago, and I'll tell you. I, I mean, I speak a little bit of French. I have never been able to figure out what the title of this restaurant is. I, I do not know how you translate Odu Mago. If you can figure it out, good on you. Uh, across the street is Le Fleur, which is very easy to translate, the flower. And they're still there today, although usually the people that go there today are dorky, nerdy tourists like me. <laughs> There's, I don't think as much of a vibrant cultural scene happening there. Just people who go there and be like, ooh, this is the place where the existentialists hung out. Wow. All right. But back in the day, the 40s and the 50s, you might bump into famous existentialists like these two people. On the right is probably the single most important feminist of the 20th century. Her name was Simone de Beauvoir. And to her right, our left, is her boyfriend, and the man who essentially coined the term existentialism, his name was Jean-Paul Sartre. Let's talk about Sartre first. The term existentialism comes out of his writing. And he wrote a, a popular essay, which I don't have listed up here, called Existentialism is a Humanism. Excerpts from that essay sometimes make an appearance on um, in in. AP Euro textbooks, and sometimes on tests. But here are the uh, three, uh, well, I would say big things that he wrote, significant things that he wrote, uh, not necessarily in, in chronological order. And as I'm looking at them, I'm realizing that these are, I, I wrote them down in the order that uh, I think, well, of their quality. <laughs> so in, in terms of like what's the most enjoyable thing to read, I'd say nausea first, no exit second, being in nothingness, a distant third. But all right, Jean-Paul Sartre, before I actually talk about his writings, let me talk about him just a little bit. He came from a, an intellectual and upper class, upper middle class family, went to the Sorbonne at the University of Paris, where there is a young woman in his philosophy class classes named Simone de Beauvoir. And he had a very competitive relationship with Simone de Beauvoir and his philosophy classes. They were both vying for the best grades in the class. They did not like each other at all. 
And needless to say, it's laid the foundation for a lifelong love affair. They eventually became best friends and then lovers and then had a very interesting uh, love life together, which I will talk about a little bit later on here. When, uh, so Jean-Paul Sartre began publishing in the 1930s and becomes renowned as a great writer. Uh, when World War II breaks out, he was uh, captured and imprisoned by the Germans but then eventually let go and goes back to Paris, France. He Sartre did not take active part in the French resistance. Sartre at the time, uh, during World War II and after, was a celebrity writer in France. And that's how he would have been known back then as a, as a writer, as a novelist, and as a playwright. But he had written some philosophical tre treatises as well. He, you know, he, he he earned his degree at the Sorbonne in philosophy and then wrote his principal magnum opus book on philosophy called Being and Nothingness, which was published in the middle of the 1950s. Being, nothing, being and Nothingness is a large book, or at least a large book for philosophy. All right. So Jean-Paul Sartre's the guy who coins the term existentialism. Let's finally get to what it means to be an existentialist. And in order to do that, I've got to go all the way back to antiquity. And one of the very first philosophers we talked about in this class, and that's Aristotle. And if you remember, Aristotle was one of the first scientists in Western civilization. He was the daughter, he was not the daughter, he was the son of a doctor. And that doctor's like attitude and mindset and perception of things influenced how uh, he looked at everything, including nature. He was, uh, you know, he wrote on everything, including biology. And Aristotle became fascinated with seeds that turn into things like flowers. Now, some of you may remember this as I, when I talked about it in August, but here's what Aristotle saw. He looked at a seed as this magnificent thing. It's like, well, you take this seed, if you plant it in soil with nutrients in it, give it the appropriate amount of water and sunlight, this seed grows into a flower. Let's say specifically, a rose bush. You take another group of seeds and you plant them and they grow and they become, they, they turn into, I don't know, something else. Let's say a, from an acorn grows an oak tree. So essentially contained in this seed is the blueprint of what it can potentially become if given the right environment. And he was fascinated with this. He's like, wow, within this seed is a rose bush. You can't see the rose bush yet. It's in, it's in this thing, but you got you to gotta plant it and give it the right nutrients, etc. And then it grows into this beautiful rose bush. Wow, what an incredible thing. So he takes this concept of essence and he develops it. So he says, within the seed is a flower. So therefore, the seed contains the essence of flower. He would say that contained in the seed contain, is something called flower nests. And all the seed needs is the right environment and a flower will grow out of it. So before the flower even exists, it has an essence in the seed. All right. So Aristotle says that essence precedes existence. Okay, so, so what? What's the big deal with all of this? Well, according to Aristotle, we are all like the seeds that germinate and grow into something. And Aristotle would suggest that contained within you is a particular essence. And this essence is who you are going to become in life. So, for example, I am a teacher. Aristotle would argue that I had within me, from the very beginning, whatever the beginning was, the essence of teacherness. And that I was placed in the right environment, uh, I was given an education, I was given opportunities to reach my potential to become a teacher, and I therefore became a teacher. Aristotle would say this was always contained inside of me. Teacherness. So Aristotle would say to you as teenagers that you also have an essence. Maybe you have the essence of doctorness. Maybe you have the essence of lawyerness. Maybe you have the essence of politicianess. 
Maybe, if you're unfortunate, <laughs> you have the essence of teacherness too. But you have with inside of you essentially a destiny, something that you're going to become. Now, you will only become this, you will only become this if you are given the right conditions. So, just like a seed needs soil with nutrients in it, uh, water, sunlight, etc., you know, you also need to have a stable home, a good education, freedom from fear and hunger, the opportunity to you know, go on and get a, a college degree or something like this. And if you have these opportunities, then you will, as Aristotle said, you will flourish. Uh, that's the English version of the Greek word that he used to describe somebody, you know, achieving their essence is flourishing. All right. So in other words, Aristotle says, you have a destiny. You have a destiny. The essence of who you are is already inside of you. This is proof that everything in the universe is meaningful. This is proof of the existence of God. You have something inside of you that you're good at. You have other things that you're not good at. So for example, Aristotle would say, Endris, uh, you will flourish as a teacher, but you probably would make a horrible lawyer. Teaching is your essence, not being a lawyer. And the same would go with you. So Aristotle would say to you as a teenager right now that it's your goal to discover, well, what is this essence that's with inside of me? And then how do I cultivate it so that I one day can flourish and experience happiness? All right, so there's meaning in life. You have an essence. All is right with the world. This way of thinking was significantly challenged in the Second World War. Now, very few people during the Second World War were well acquainted with Aristotelian philosophy. However, in the 20s and 30s, or especially at the dawn of the 20th century, there was a sense that, all right, I have a life. My life has purpose. I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to have a home and a spouse and a few kids and life's going to be grand. Life is going to develop in a particular way. But then, well, First World War, Depression, Second World War, people's lives just got upended. You didn't have to be a student of Aristotelian philosophy to begin thinking to yourself, well, I'm not sure if really there's some plan here. If there is a God, where is God? It seems like we're all sort of left down here to struggle for survival. I've seen good people die. I've seen bad people live. In wartime, you see some of the most selfish, cruel, and brutal behaviors emerge out of ordinary people. People essentially started questioning whether or not there is some sort of divine plan here. And after World War II, with the threat of a nuclear holocaust for all humanity, this faith in, well, everything's going to be okay, really was challenged. There was a fundamental uneasiness throughout the entirety of the Cold War. And it is all of these things that made existentialism a popular philosophy. Not just the uneasiness and, and, uh, and the horror of the 20th century that made existentialism a popular philosophy, but it's also because the existentialists themselves didn't just write philosophy books. They wrote novels and plays, and they made their ideas accessible to the masses. And that's another reason why existentialism became very popular. All right, so the easiest way to understand Jean-Paul Sartre and the defini definition of existentialism is to turn Aristotle's statement on its head. Aristotle said that essence precedes existence, that you essentially have a soul, that you have somebody that you are destined to be, provided that you cultivate, it pro cultivate that properly. Aristotle said existence precedes essence. No, that's not what Aristotle said. Aristotle said essence precedes existence. Sartre comes along and literally flips this phrase on its head. Jean-Paul Sartre says existence precedes essence. All right, so what's that mean? It means you have no destiny. It means you have no soul. It means you have no essence. It means that all you are in life are the choices that you make. You don't have a destiny. You choose what you are going to become. You choose what you are going to do. You choose your essence. Okay, so let me explain this. 
You're born. You're raised in Upper Arlington, Ohio. Most like, likely the language that you speak in your home is English, but if you don't speak English in your home, you speak another language in your home and you learn how to speak English in, when you go to school in Upper Arlington. You absorb the culture of your home and of Upper Arlington. You don't really have too much of a choice about this when you're you know, growing up, when you're a young kid. You are given particular food to eat. You are given particular clothing to wear. You have to go to a particular school and you absorb the culture and the values of all these things. But then you get a little bit older, you turn into a teenager, and now you probably are gonna start questioning some of these things and making some decisions for like, well, I like this part of our culture and I don't like this other part of the culture. I'm going to start challenging uh, some of the values of my parents, of my teachers, my community, and I am going to be an individual. All right, so now you're making these choices. And you have all, at this point in time in your life, made these choices. Think of the friends that you have right now. Think of the clothing that you're wearing right now. Thinking, think about how you choose to spend your free time. All of these things are choices. Think about what you would like to do after you graduate from high school, where you want to go, potentially what you want to do, what you want to study. All of these things are choices. Now, here's where we pause. Where's the stuff coming from? Are you like Aristotle and, say, and do you believe that all this stuff has been deep inside of you all along? That this is your essence, this is your soul? Or are you like Jean-Paul Sartre? You're born in a particular place, born in a particular time, you are given these particular values from your community and such, but then you decide, well, I can do whatever it is that I wanna do. I am absolutely free and I can make a choice. So, when I find out there's a party and I go to this party and somebody passes around a joint, I have to make a choice. What choice do I make? Is it destiny that I make a particular choice? Or is it whatever I happen to do at this particular moment? Okay, but once you make that choice, and you can think for yourself just for that moment, like in that particular situation, like well, what do you do? You know, was it destiny or is it just like, okay, I'm going to make a, a random decision here. Now, after you come to your own personal conclusion about what's going on there, according to Sartre, once you make that choice, then that choice defines who you are. That's your essence. So it's not a destiny. It's a choice. It's simply a choice whether or not you are drug-free or a stoner. And it's those choices that define you. So existence precedes essence. And that phrase is where existentialism comes from. And this is the most simple way in which you can understand yourself from the existentialist perspective. All you are is the sum of choices that you make. And for all the existentialists, there's this big focus on the word choice. The other word they love is freedom. You are absolutely free to be anything that you want. So even things where you think, well, I, there's a biological destiny here for me, like your sexuality. So you're born heterosexual and all the science suggests that you know your, sexual, your, your sexuality is something that you're born with. But Jean-Paul Sartre would even say, even no matter what, you still could choose to become homosexual. You are absolutely free. Okay. So that's the basics of existentialism. That's existentialism in a nutshell right there. That's Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialism. Okay, so think about this for a minute. Imagine the culture that this creates. Uh, the existentialists were very, very popular. And this creates this culture in Paris, France after World War II. And it, it, it spreads throughout Europe pretty well. It even comes here to the United States uh, in, the, in the 1950s, 1960s, especially among uh, intellectual college students. And it, and it does influence our... Uh, our culture as well. There was here in the United States a lot of association between uh, existentialism and uh, jazz as jazz got really weird in the 1950s and 1960s when we had like hard bop jazz and modal jazz and cool jazz, guys like John Coltrane, Miles Davis. There was an association with this existentialist lifestyle and, uh, and, and, and that music. But anyway, that's neither here nor there right now. Um, in Europe and in Paris, France, it's created a culture. And people, especially this new generation, really inspired by uh, Sartre and the existentialists and coming out of war. And if you're in your 20s, there's a sense that, well, to hell with tradition, to hell with anything from the past. We're going to create, we're going to be whoever we choose to be. 
we could potentially create a whole new society. And this really excites and inspires the next generation of young people in Europe. This is still not quite the baby boomer generation yet. This was uh, like people in their 20s who had seen the war in their teens. All right, so that's existentialism in a nutshell, but there's still quite a, a lot more to go with uh, the whole existentialist movement and existentialist philosophy. So um, let's uh, learn about this particular aspect of Sartre's philosophy about freedom. So in his book uh, from the 1950s, Being in Nothingness, there is a sort of a, a section in there called At the Precipice. And it's in this section from Being in Nothingness where Sartre tries to make an airtight case for how you are absolutely free, how you have no destiny, for how you have no soul. And so here's what he writes about. He says, imagine yourself at the precipice of a cliff, like uh, these guys here from this picture taken from Yosemite, California in the 19th century. Imagine you're at a cliff and you look over the face of the cliff and you look down hundreds of feet. You realize that you could die. And what happens to you? Well, you feel something in your gut, anxiety, maybe vertigo. You're like, I got to back out of here. I got I to get away from this cliff face. Now, why do you feel this anxiety? Why do you feel this vertigo? Well, I think most people would say, well, this is a survival instinct. I, my, I look at this, it registers in my brain that I'm near death or something that could, <laughs> something really bad. I got to get out of here. So it's just a natural reaction. Back away from the cliff face, right? Sartre says, well, okay, that's all very fine, well, and good, but there's also something else that's going on. As you're at the cliff face, you realize, I could make a choice, and that choice could be just to take one little step, and it's all over. I'm dead. And it's not really a natural death, it's an untimely death, and you're not even like, suicidal or anything, you just realize that this option is available to you. And when you realize this option is available to you, and you realize you're free to do whatever it is you want, including taking a step off a cliff, you feel nausea, you feel vertigo, you feel anxiety. These emotional states are indicators for Sartre that you're probably confronting your freedom at this particular point in time. And Sartre's probably willing to bet that you and me and all of us have had a moment where we kind of looked, maybe it was over the edge of a cliff or some steep fall, top of a building or something like that, and thought to ourselves, yeah, I could jump. And you're not, you're not suicidal or anything. You just realize that that thought goes through your head. I, I, I could end it right now. And for Sartre, that is proof that you do not have a destiny, that that option is always there for you. All right, so this seems to be an extreme example, but it serves as the foundation for Sartre's first great book. And in my own personal opinion, if you're gonna read something by Jean-Paul Sartre, this is probably the most uh, engaging and accessible thing to read. All right, he wrote this book called Nausea, and this is a novel. It's a fairly short novel, I forget exactly how long, probably just under 200 pages, something around there. And in this book, the young man who's a protagonist realizes that he can do whatever he wants to with his life, that his life's been on a particular course, but he doesn't have to continue on that course. And as soon as he starts reflecting on that, well, he starts getting sick to his stomach. He start experiencing, starts experiencing anxiety, starts experiencing nausea. So you guys might feel this way. I bet that you know when you graduate from high school, most of you guys go on to college or whatever it is that you do after high school. You know, as you get as as you prepare for that experience, you're gonna feel some dis-ease. You're gonna feel some uncomfortableness. Maybe vertigo or nausea is a little extreme, but maybe those things. Now, why are you experiencing those things? Jean-Paul Sartre says that those things are symptoms of the fact that you are confronting your freedom, that life is insecure, that you can go and make any choices that you want to do or that you want to make. You can do whatever it is you want to do. All right, so Jean-Paul Sartre's theory. <laughs> so once again, to reiterate, who are you? Were you born with a soul or an essence? Well, if you're Aristotle, yes. If you're Sartre and the existentialist, no. All you are is the sum of the choices that you make. And at any particular point of time in your life, you can choose to make different choices, to put your life on a different trajectory. 
who you are and your sense of self is the product of your own creation. This is what the existentialists believe for the most part. All right. And I say for the most part because there are different existentialists who have you know, slightly varying perspectives on human freedom and the choices that we make. But for Sartre, who's the big existentialist, that's the big stuff. All right. So Sartre would also talk about something called authenticity versus bad faith or inauthenticity. He would say that the majority of human beings don't really think about these things and they live very inauthentic lives. They don't recognize their freedom. So these will be people who, let's say, you know, they're born and raised in Upper Arlington and then they're you know, getting ready to graduate from Upper Arlington. Well, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to go to college, of course. Of course. Uh, why? Well, they don't know. They don't think about it. They're just, well, this is the next thing to do. And then they graduate from college. All right, so then what do you do? Well, you, you, know, you know, you get a job. And then what do you do? Well, probably uh, find a spouse, get married. Okay, ding, then you do that. Okay, and then you're like 30. Okay, let's get a, let's, let's make some babies. All right, let's have some kids. All right, uh, now, now what do we do? Oh, we'll move back to Upper Arlington where we can raise our kids in a good school system. You know, okay, so ding, so you move back to Upper Arlington. You know, and you just kind of like follow... The, the, the social norms and the expectations of society without thinking ever, wait, I've got a choice here. I don't have to go to college. I don't have to get married. I don't have to move back to Upper Arlington and have a nice house and three kids and a Weber grill. You know, so Sartre says most people live like that. They live in bad faith. They don't confront the uncomfortableness of their own freedom. But those that do, he says, live authentic lives. Now, I say that nausea is one of the best things that Sartre ever wrote. Uh, quite a few of my friends would say, no, this is probably the most engaging thing. And, and it is probably a quicker read. His play, Hui Clou, which is usually translated as No Exit. No Exit is a play. And the play is a very interesting play. It's, it's a very psychological, it's one of the great psychodramas of the 20th century theater. And here's what it's about. It's about three people that find themselves in a room. Uh, one man, two women. And they start talking to each other and they realize, oh, we're dead. Like, they're, they're, they don't, as, they, as they try to figure out what they're, you know, why they're here in this room together and how they got here, they realize, oh, we died. We each died. And now we're stuck in, a, in, a, in this room together. And so they're like, well, are we in heaven or are we in hell? And they kind of look around and everything's very nice and everything's very comfortable. So whatever it is in the afterlife, they're like, well, this isn't too bad. The only thing that this room doesn't seem to have, it doesn't seem to have any mirrors. So they can never look at themselves. The only thing they can do is look at the other two, while the other two look back at you. As each of the three people tell their story, they tell their story about their life from their own first-person perspective, and they justify their lives, like, here's who I was, here's how I lived. And what you realize throughout the course of the play is that all three of these characters are, in different ways, not very nice people. And that this is, in fact, their hell. And that eventually, each character starts judging the other characters. And there's this great discomfort. Now, so why aren't there any mirrors in the room? Well, this is sort of an interesting symbolic thing. Sartre doesn't want any of the characters to be able to look at his or her own self to be able to make their own judgment the only, about themselves. The only way they can see themselves is through the eyes of another person. And they will do this to each other. There's one particular scene in Hui Clo where one of the characters gazes into the eyes of the other person to see a reflection of themselves so they can do their hair or whatnot. And it, it weirds him out. It's very creepy looking, you know, looking at this, other, this, this into these per this person's eyes and knowing they're looking right back at you with these judgments that you know are going on behind their eyes. So they're in a room with comfortable furniture. Everything's very, very nice. And they realize that this is their hell. And the male character in the play eventually pops and makes this declaration. L'enfer, c'est les autres. Hell is other people. We don't need fires. We don't need pokers. We don't need torture machines. Trapped in a room with two other people who judge us for the rest of eternity, that's hell. So it's a very interesting uh, psychological play. A great moment in this play for me, though, is when the door opens. So there's a moment where the door to the room just completely opens. 
and they could totally walk out. They could totally leave their hell. And they, and none of them do. Instead, they all kind of look at each other like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? You'd think they'd make, they'd all be making a break for it, but they don't. Instead, they turn and they look at each other. So for me, at least, that's a scene that suggests that even though hell is other people, there's a sense of dependence upon those other people. Anyways, it's an interesting play. Huy clos, no exit in English. All right. Hey, that's enough for Jean-Paul Sartre. Now we move on to his girlfriend, his woman friend, Simone de Beauvoir. They had a very passionate and rather interesting love affair that I will talk about at the end of uh, my presentation on Simone de Beauvoir. But let's understand the importance of Simone de Beauvoir like this. She is probably the single most important feminist of the 20th century. Even the big American feminists of the late 20th century, women like Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, all of them, or at least those two ladies in particular, drew their inspiration from Simone de Beauvoir. Now, before I talk about Simone de Beauvoir's existentialist feminist philosophy in her own right, I thought I would contextualize her within the full scope of European history, or at least of our AP European history course. Since the College Board frequently asks questions about women's history, I thought it might be a, this might be a nice place to review all of that. So I thought I would review some of the other important feminists from different time periods throughout European history. And what's cool to think about is that um, all of these previous uh, female authors and activists were people that Simone de Beauvoir studied, uh, including our first one. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir wrote about Christine de Pazan. So Christine de Pazan, who was she? She is considered to be a humanist at the dawn of the Renaissance. I mean, look at the years that she lived. She's 14th, early 15th century. She's the generation that comes around after the plague of 1348. Uh, Christine de Pazan uh, comes from Italy, from northern Italy. She was born in northern Italy. She was the daughter of a nobleman. So she was uh, came from a family of wealth, which means she was herself well-educated. She could read and write. And then she married a man. It was probably an arranged marriage. Uh, they had children together, and then her husband dies. All right, so you are a single mother, a widow in the late 14th century. you got not just yourself to take care of, but children to take care of. How do you survive in this particular situation? Well, for most women, the first thing you're going to do is find the first man who will marry you, hitch your wagon to him, hope that he's a semi-decent human being and will take decent care of you and your children, and there's your gamble. That's what you're going to do. Christine de Pizan is did not do that. She decided that she was going to try to make money in her own right, so she wanted her economic freedom. So because she can read and write, she begins the work of translating poetry. And these works of poetry garner her some income, so much so that she can become self-sufficient. So then she starts writing her own poetry and selling that. And that made her a minor celebrity. So even though she's from northern Italy, she ended up being patronized by the king of France and French aristocracy, so she ends up in Paris. This is amazing for a woman of the 14th century. And there, at the dawn of the 15th century, she starts writing these, what can essentially be considered guidebooks, instructional manuals for how to be an independent woman. Uh, probably the most famous of these is Treasure of the City of Ladies, 1405 is when that was published. And it provides instruction instructions for when you are married, here's what you need to know in terms of how to treat your spouse, how to treat your man, how to take care of your household. And all these things sound like very domestic things, like she's supporting this traditional role for women. She's not. She writes about these things for how to do these particular things in a way that provides safety and security for you financial security, uh, emotional security, physical safety, all these things. She also, in several passages, reaffirms how smart women are. And she talks about this in funny ways. She talks about this, about how men both 
make fun of women and then get frustrated with women. So she says, you know, men get frustrated or, 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 or make fun of us because they say that, oh, we're flighty, that we're only interested in superficial things. But then when they try to seduce us, when they try to win us over, when they want us to be their girlfriends or wives or whatever, well, then they find that we're very difficult, that we're very stubborn. And she says that should be proof that we're actually a whole lot smarter than you think. So if you find yourself having to write an essay about the Renaissance, and especially the early Renaissance era, and you need the example of a female, a female humanist, Christine de Pizan, there you go. Going forward, Quite a bit of time in history. We make it to the end of the Enlightenment era, to the French Revolution, and to Olympe de Gouche, a woman who was so excited in 1789 that the French were going to create a new society based upon the principles of the Enlightenment, based upon the principles of freedom, based upon questioning the institutions of the past. And she hopes that women are going to be free, that women are going to have political rights just like men. But what she finds is that no, all these men from the third estate, when they get their freedom, they think this is great, that this is the product of the Enlightenment, but they are still not going to let women have their freedom. So she famously rewrites the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and, uh, re and, and changes all of the pronouns in it. All the he's go to she's, all the man go the all the man's go to woman's, and we have her most famous work, the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and Citizeness. It came out in 1791. As the French Revolution enters the convention years uh, in 1793, and she continues to push that government for more freedom and has the daring to criticize the National Convention for not fulfilling the promise of the Enlightenment, she sadly gets her head cut off. Uh, this, of course, didn't happen to her exclusively because she was a female, but because she dared to criticize the Convention at a time when France was under attack uh, from within and from without. And so everybody was expected to be patriotic and wave the flag and not to question anything the Convention was doing, or they'd face the guillotine. Um, the National Convention had a policy where everybody, and this was part of the Committee of Public Safety, they were to organize society so that everybody had a job in protecting France. So, for example, old men uh, who were too old to fight in the military were expected to give patriotic speeches. Women were, of course, to tend to their homes. They were to you know, raise their children. They were to encourage uh, their men to fight and their sons to fight for the French Republic. And that was the role of women. And she openly criticized that. And she said, this is not all that women should be doing, that we should have political rights as well. And because she criticized the convention, of course, she gets her heads chopped off in the guillotine. All right. Pretty much at the same period of time, we also have up in England, Mary Wollstonecraft. Most famous work comes out in 1792, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. It's important to know that Mary Wollstonecraft is different from Olympe de Gouche in that she did not focus on the political rights of women. So this title is frequently misread by people today because they see a vindication of the rights of women. They assume that it's, well, Mary Wollstonecraft saying, hey, all women should have the right to vote. We should have the right to the same jobs as men or something like that. And that is not really what this book is about. This book concerns Mary Wollstonecraft's lifelong concern, which is, the education of girls. Mary Wollstonecraft wants to argue, as she does throughout this book, that women should be educated in the same way as men, that men are encouraged to use their, their, their prefrontal cortex, although she would have said it like that. that. Men are encouraged to use their brains to think logically, to think rationally. Uh, men should do math and science and political science and philosophy and these types of things. And girls at the time that received some blue stocking education, well, they didn't get the same type of education. They were taught a foreign language. They were taught to study poetry. They were studied, They were taught to recite Shakespeare. And she's like, well, that's very good, but it's a very unbalanced education that women are the intellectual equals of men. But we've just never been taught how to think like men. And Mary Wollstonecraft dreams of a day and age where men and women get educated in the exact same way. And she believes this will un unleash the potential of women. 
Now, another part of a vindication of the rights of women is how marriage is a terrible and awful institution and is effectively a form of slavery. But whether you're talking about uh, the role of women in marriage or, the, or how girls are educated, Mary Wollstonecraft, a, a lot more of a psychologist, uh, or very much a psychologist, and focused on the psychology of women as opposed to just the political rights of women like Olympe de Gouche, Mary Wollstonecraft really talks about the toll this takes on women and how they really don't see themselves as people with potential. They are effectively taught to be servants to men. All right, and that's Mary Wollstonecraft, Vindication of, a, of the Rights of Woman, which came out in 1792, a couple years before she herself left for France to participate in the French Revolution. Moving forward, about a decade, we get to Emmeline Pankhurst, and we're back into women having a role in politics. Emmeline Pankhurst organized a political movement, the suffragist movement in England. Her philosophy was this, men accomplish great things through violent means. Men go to war. Women, therefore, if they want to accomplish something in a, men's, in a man's world, they must adopt some of these more violent tactics. So, Emmeline Pankhurst did not encourage bloodshed, but she did significantly encourage radical property destruction. So she wanted women to have the right to vote. And she is probably more than any other uh, woman in England at the time, the single most important person in achieving women's suffrage at the end of World War I. And she does this by targeting particular politicians and institutions that are against the women's suffrage movement and destroying their property. When I say destroying their property, what I mean is blowing up buildings. Uh, these bombs will go off at night. Uh, nobody gets hurt, but there is a whole lot of property destruction. Needless to say, when Emmeline Pankhurst is discovered as uh, being behind all this, she's arrested and goes to jail. But while she's in jail, she is still no less radical she decides to go on a hunger strike. And these radical methods of fighting eventually earn women the right to vote in England. Emmeline Pankhurst uh, directly influences the 20th century suffragist and suffragettes in the United States. Here on our side of the Atlantic, the individual probably most responsible for the passage of the 19th Amendment was Alice Paul. And Alice Paul, uh, spent time in England studying under Emmeline Pankhurst and the suffragettes there. All right, so there you go. Guys, the College Board loves to ask questions on women's history, so I hope this is a nice, helpful review for some of the major players in uh, the history of European feminism. But now we get to the current woman. In the middle of the 20th century, Simone de Beauvoir emerges. And the best way to understand Simone de Beauvoir, although I wonder how she would think about this, uh, is to take Sartre's ideas of existentialism. You are absolutely free. You have no essence. You are who you choose to be. And you apply these things to feminism. You apply these concepts to women and how a woman should or could live her life. Simone de Beauvoir's magnum opus is a huge monumental book called The Second Sex, in French, Le Deuxième Sex. Now, when I say this is a huge book, I mean that uh, both uh, figuratively and literally. Uh, literally, it's usually published in two volumes. I have no clue how many pages this thing is in total, but it is a large book. And then, it's, in, in terms of its significance, its impact has been immense. If you go to college and you take any feminist class, which probably some of you will do, you will inevitably read at least passages of the second sex. I don't know how many people actually read the whole thing all the way through, although I'm sure there's still quite a number of people who do because the book is still in print and still widely, well, at least sold. <laughs> but here it is, the second sex. All right, so in this monumentally large book, Simone de Beauvoir spends a whole lot of time talking about the history of women especially in Europe, and she talks about a lot of these figures, like all the way back to Christine de Pizan, in terms of women, how they're perceived by, to, how they're perceived by men, how they're judged by men, and then how they absorb a lot of those values 
and how they live in accord with the values that society presents to them. So you're a girl, you're born in a particular time and place, you're told here's what girls are like, here's what girls are to be, here are your Barbie dolls or whatever, and that you absorb those values. Now, if you do that, then you're living a life of bad faith. This is an inauthentic life. If you never realize that you, are, you in fact, can make choices at any particular point of time, you can be whoever it is you want to be. So you don't have to conform to society's norms. So who you are is who you can choose to be. But that is, of, is of course, extraordinarily hard. You have to be willing to, you know, if you want to be somebody who, that, that breaks out of the norm, you know, you know you're going to face society's judgment, and that, that might make life hard for you. So here's a nice easy quote uh, that's very existentialist that comes out of the second sex. Simone de Beauvoir says, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. And with that word becomes should be inherent this concept of choice. Who you are is who you choose to be. But with the case of women, even more so than men, far more so than men, women have felt, or I guess this is more than a feeling, women have been put in a position where they can't just choose to become somebody who they want to be because of economic constraints that have been placed on their lives. I mean, the story of Christine de Pazan is an extraordinary and exceptional story. You know, you can say, well, I want to be somebody, but you're still going to have to deal with the reality of the world, which is, yeah, you've got to support yourself. You've got to get a roof over your head and food in your mouth some way. And so it's more than just, you know, living a quote unquote authentic life. You know, you got to make ends meet. How are you going to do that? And so when you get to the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, Simone de Beauvoir, no less than Mary Wollstonecraft, really encourages women, do not get married. Be your own independent person and generate your own income because more than anything else, it is, that own, it is your own income that provides you with your freedom. So Simone de Beauvoir writes this passage in The Second Sex. She says, any woman supported by a man wife or whore, is not emancipated from the male because she has a ballot in her hand. It is through gainful employment that woman has traversed most of the distance that has separated her from the male. And I think this is why Simone de Beauvoir is very important as a mid-20th century uh, feminist. At this point in time in history, throughout most of Europe and in the United States, women have the right to vote. Women are political equals with men. So in a certain sense, you can say, okay, the end. Uh, women have equality with men. Everything that a man can do, a woman can do. A uh, woman has rights, man has rights, like, and, it's an, and they're all equal. Now, certainly there are some exceptions to that, but overwhelmingly, you know, women have the right to vote, so therefore, if they don't like the laws, they can go and vote and change those things. All right, so women are equal to men. Okay, but Simone de Beauvoir, in her book, The Second Sex, not only takes us through a historical tour of women and what women have to deal with, have had to deal with throughout most of European history, but but she also wants to reiterate: just because we have our political equality, just because we have political equality, doesn't mean that there is equality. There's two other things that she focuses on. One is the emotional state of women, a sense of psychological dependence to a man. And for that, it's, she's very similar to Mary Wollstonecraft. You need to be educated like a man. You need, to think, you need to think that, well, you're not an object. You're not helpless. You're not somebody who's dependent. You're somebody who can be independent. You're somebody who can be a doer, a maker. And Simone de Beauvoir encourages women to think like this and to go out and to make their own money and with the right thoughts and the right attitude, and with your own independent bank account, then you are free. So, okay. So there's my overview of Simone de Beauvoir. I hope that made sense. Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre had one of the most interesting relationships in the entirety of European history that I talk about, at least. Uh, first of all, take a look at this image here to the left. And you look at that and you think to yourself, wow, that looks like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre in a speedboat with Cuban communist dictator Fidel Castro standing behind them. Uh, you would be correct. 
This is not a doctored up photograph. This is an actual photograph. I think Sark's driving the boat there. <laughs> I think, I don't know. Uh, but what an interesting picture that is. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir were both active communists. In Paris, France, after World War II, 25% of the Parisian population was communist. Now, what an interesting thing. Um, when I first learned this, when I was in college, I had trouble wrapping my head around it. It's like, wait a minute. Jean-Paul Sartre, let's start with him. He talks about the importance of freedom and the importance of choice. How can a philosopher who believes so much in the importance of freedom and the importance of choice support Stalin? Because Sartre did support Stalin in the 1940s. He wrote very favorably about Stalin in his newspaper, Les Temps Modernes, that you see there on the right of this screen. Le, Les Temps Modernes means modern times. And this was a, a propaganda, this was a communist propaganda newspaper in, in Paris, France and throughout France for what it's worth. So anyway, how can somebody who believes so much on freedom and choice you know, support Stalin and believe in a communist dictatorship? Well, one way to think about it is like this. Sartre looked upon a communist society as the ideal society where all people are equal and we attempt to eliminate greed from society, which a capitalist society seems to cultivate. And so we can choose to create an egalitarian communist society. And that's what both of these two people believed. All right, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, their politics aside, let's talk about their love affair. And uh, hopefully I don't make too many people uncomfortable here, but it is kind of an interesting thing. So they did both believe in freedom, and so they didn't believe in marriage because they thought, well, Literally, they said, every day when we wake up in the morning, we're going to make a choice to be with each other or not. And they did love each other, I would say, from what I understand about their relationship. They did truly love each other. They certainly were best friends. Um, they refused to cohabitate together, so sometimes they would hang out at her place. Sometimes she would hang out at his place. Uh, they would read over each other's works. They would help edit each other's books and plays and such. And they had this great, solid working relationship, but they both were dedicated to overcoming what they felt was the bourgeois brainwashing of their youth. You know, they both came from solid, middle-class, traditional families, and they wanted to overcome this idea of, well, a mom and a dad and their children in their house, you know. They, and so they felt that the best way to do that was to overcome how they felt that they had been conditioned sexually growing up. So what this meant was they were going to have an open relationship and they were both going to sleep with men and women. And by that, I mean both of them would sleep with men and women and the other one would sleep with a man and a woman. So Sartre would sleep with guys and other women and so would Simone de Beauvoir. Even if they were ever uncomfortable with this, well, that discomfort was part of your brainwashing from childhood. Now, the reality of the situation is Simone de Beauvoir in the 1940s in particular was seen as this tall, elegant French beauty. Sartre has, was short, had a wandering eye, so he could never look directly at you. He kind of had a ghoulish quality to him. So needless to say, Sartre had a little bit more difficulty scoring new lovers in the cafes. And so literally Simone de Beauvoir uh, would try to, you know, pick up women for her boyfriend. Yeah, interesting relationship. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir actually spent some time over in New York City with a man very different from Jean-Paul Sartre, another writer named Nelson Algren. Think of an American tough guy who lives on the streets of New York City. That's Nelson Algren. And she had a passionate love affair with, with him. And he even proposed marriage to her. And she said, no, because I have to go back to France. She was in the middle of writing The Second Sex. I need to finish writing my book and I need to get back together with Jean-Paul. But man, I do wonder about, you know, what would have happened historically if uh, Simone de Beauvoir had made a lifestyle change, moved to New York City, published The Second Sex in the, Amer in the United States rather than in Paris, France, and um, married Nelson Algren and what that would have done to our uh, women's history movement that really doesn't get kickstarted until the 1960s, not really until the 1970s. But anyways, there it is. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre died in 1980. Simone de Beauvoir died in 1986. When Jean-Paul Sartre died, testimony to their friendship, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, grief-stricken, and threw herself on top of the corpse of Jean-Paul 
and refused to let go for two days. Uh, she just clung, she just clung to it. Uh, this was her best friend in life who she'd been friends with since they were college kids at the Sorbonne and he was gone now. And that to me is testimony to their friendship, no matter how wild their personal lives were. So there you go. Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. The last existentialist that I'm going to talk about is Albert Camus. Albert Camus was friends with Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. Albert Camus won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the year 1960. Albert Camus is considered to be one of the greatest writers who ever came out of France, and that is untrue, because he's not actually French. He's Algerian. Now, when he was born in Algeria in the years leading up to uh, World War I, Algeria was, of course, France. Algeria does not earn its independence from France until the 1950s. And the French-Algerian War was personally devastating for Albert Camus. But Albert Camus grew up a pied noir, a Blackfoot, in Algeria. He grew up in poverty. His dad died in the First World War. He never knew his dad. His mom was mute. His mom did not speak, and that had a profound effect on uh, Camus' development as a child. Mom never spoke. And then the poverty. The last book of Camus' original work to ever get published is a work called The First Man, and it's about his poverty growing up and the emotional strain, not just the financial strain, but the emotional strain that it puts on, a fam on, a, on his family. Um, so this picture that you're looking at here, if you're looking at it, uh, this is a picture of uh, Camus' family. And I put a little blue star there on little Camus. There he is, little Albert. Uh, and he, I mean, I love this picture because it shows what an eclectic family they've got there. You know, with a, you see the confluence of French culture and Algerian culture, a couple of the guys there wearing a fez, and then a, a couple other guys at least wearing a a more traditional European hat, and a little Albert Camus right there in the middle of it all. So Camus, uh, in his own story, talks about how there were really two things that provided him freedom from the poverty, or two things that helped him to transcend the poverty in which he was raised. And one was school, which probably is why Camus goes down in history as one of the great writers of all time. He, um, he really fell in love with school and education, and he talked about how he would get upset when he read books, books where the text didn't go all the way across the page. He couldn't stand white space in a book when he was a little kid because he's like, what a waste of paper. He wanted there to be text everywhere so that he would have more to read. Obviously, books and education, schooling was a way out of poverty for Albert Camus. And lucky for him, uh, he was one of the lucky ones who had a great teacher who really reached out to him and really encouraged his family to allow him to go to college someday. Uh, the other thing that uh, Camus said was a way out of poverty, and boy do I love him for this, soccer. Albert Camus did not dream of growing up to becoming a great philosopher. He grew up wanting to become a professional soccer player. Here he is as a boy with one of his soccer teams. Um, I didn't put a blue star on him here, but he's sort of in the same position in the picture. He's the one with the hat on and the dark shirt and the scarf uh, kneeling at the at the bottom of this picture. Um, he's got on different attire because he was a goalkeeper. And Albert Camus actually did get to play for a minor league soccer team in Algeria. But his dreams of being a professional athlete were vanished when he was diagnosed with tuberculosis, TB. TB is a lung disease. Albert Camus would frequently have coughing spit, fits where he'd spit up blood. Uh, tuberculosis was essentially a death sentence. And that might be uh, something worth remembering as we talk about the philosophy of Albert Camus. I, I think it might have influenced him in the way he thought about life. This idea that you could always die. That you could have a coughing fit, not be able to stop, choke on blood, die. And with that horror kind of hanging over you at all, uh, at all times, you know, it might refocus your life a little bit. Albert Camus uh, was in Paris in the spring of 1940 when 
the Germans invaded and took over Paris. Uh, he spent a little bit of time just writing and uh, making and some of his books, as you'll see, got published during World War II. But then Albert Camus, it is worth knowing, uh, different from Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, became an active uh, member of the French resistance, uh, collecting information about the Nazis, uh, passing it on to people who could potentially assassinate high-ranking Nazis in Paris. Um, if you were uh, in the French resistance, uh, your, li your average lifespan became two months before the Nazis figured out who you were and just executed you. So Albert Camus really made a daring and bold life decision as a young man uh, during the Second World War in Paris. And Paris is pretty much where he's going to make his livelihood. He's going to become a writer and a playwright in Paris. And so he doesn't spend too much time back in Algeria. And that's why, because he's such a prominent intellectual in Paris, that most people, when they identify him, they just simply identify him as a French writer. Okay. So Albert Camus' philosophy, he is identified as an existentialist, even though he never embraced that moniker for himself. He did not like that label. Albert Camus' philosophy is extraordinarily complex. It's not as easy to summarize as just, hey, we're absolutely free. We define ourselves by our choices. Albert Camus' philosophy is a lot more uh, complicated than that. But it's a rich philosophy, and it's since this is the last philosopher I'm going to talk about for the whole course, I hope it's one that you're able to embrace a little bit, kind of get into. So here's what Albert Camus believed, and I'm going to talk about his works out of order here, but I hope it helps me to present a cohesive overview of his philosophy as a whole. Okay, so perhaps the most famous philosophy book that Albert Camus ever wrote was a book called The Myth of Sisyphus, which was published during World War II. And the myth of Sisyphus deals with the character of Sisyphus from Greek mythology, a man who was condemned by the gods for an eternal punishment that they thought would drive a man crazy, which was to push a boulder up to the top of a mountain, let it go, walk back down to the bottom of the mountain, and repeat over and over and over for all eternity. The gods thought that this would make a man go insane. So... Albert Camus, when he thought about the myth of Sisyphus, thought that this is a perfect metaphor for each and every one of our lives. So, in your life, you're expected to do stuff. And you do stuff, and it gets done, but then there's just more stuff to do. And you just, well, you do that stuff, and then there's, you get done with it, and hooray, hooray, but you don't really have time to celebrate because there's going to be other stuff to do. You go through your work week, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's the weekend, hooray, it's the weekend, but then, oh, then there's Monday, you go back to work, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yay, it's the weekend, oh, but then it's Monday, oh, back to work, and then, you know, the cycle repeats itself, you go through a school year, you're like, oh, it's a new school year, and then you go through that school year, and then, oh, okay, this is great, well, then there's a new school year, then there's a new school year, and then there's work, and it's like, you're just kind of stuck in cycles, yeah, you're stuck in cycles, there's no progress. There's no development. There's no sense that things are getting better. Albert Camus defines the fundamental condition of humanity as one of meaninglessness, or to use his word, one of absurdity. Absurdity is, which means meaninglessness, is the fundamental condition of all of our lives. There is no meaning. Okay, so hopefully you see how this is very similar to Jean-Paul Sartre, that we make choices to create our own sense of self. And, and Albert Camus is similar to this, slightly similar, although there's a different take on it in a, in a, in a subtle way, that you know, you're going to have to create your own meaning in life. But even as I say that, I'm like, that doesn't really fully capture Albert Camus. Okay, so the fundamental condition in life is absurdity, is meaninglessness. Now, as I'm talking about this, and I know that my audience are all teenagers, I think that you, at some level, would say, well, okay, yeah, I go to school every year, and I have this Monday through Friday week, but, you know, I still go from being a freshman to a sophomore to a junior to a senior, and then I graduate, and then I'm an adult, and I can vote, and I go to college, most likely. I get a career, and then I can live on my own, and I'll have my own home, and I'll have my own family, and I'll be doing my own thing, and life gets better. In other words, there 
is progress. Camus is fundamentally wrong. There is progress. And even I, as an adult, can say, well, uh, I'm a teacher. I've got you know, almost 20 years of experience. Hopefully I'm getting better as a teacher, that I'm better now than I was 20 years ago when I was just starting off or starting off and I barely knew anything. And then hopefully 20 years from now, I'll be a wiser, uh, uh, better individual then. So there is progress. But Camus would remind us that, well, first of all, in terms of happiness, even if our life circumstances are changing, there's probably no real development in happiness. So in other words, because I feel like I need to clarify this here, there is no sense that, okay, once I graduate from high school and I go to college, then I will be happier. Uh, once I uh, retire from teaching, then I will be happier. What you find is for, for Camus is that, well, no, you're probably going to still be the same level of happy. Or if you are happier, it's not because you've achieved something more, but rather because you've changed your perception of your life. So there's that. And there's this fundamental absurdity that underlies everything that you do. So even I could get struck down dead by some bizarre accident, like a car accident or something like that, tomorrow. And so all of my development as a teacher, you know, what ultimately did that do? There's still a fundamental meaninglessness in our activities. So in our own personal lives, as well as in the story of humanity as a whole, there, things change, situations change, but there's no development in that things are getting better, things are getting more wonderful, things are getting happier. Instead, there's a fundamental meaninglessness in life. There's a fundamental absurdity which goes through our life. Okay, so that's where he starts from. Now, I'm kind of curious, like, well, how you feel about that? Like, is Camus right? Is Camus wrong? But embrace it here for a second. Just accept this for a second and to kind of think about what this might mean then. If your life has no meaning and all it really is is a series of tasks that you're expected to perform, then my gosh, isn't this an awful life? And why then would life be worth living? And is life in any way worth living? That's the fundamental question of the myth of Sisyphus. And this is why this is still considered to be a very popular, this is still a very popular book. In terms of philosophy books today, it has probably the most dramatic opening of any philosophy book. So here it is. Here's a screenshot of the opening paragraph of Albert Camus, The Myth of Sisyphus. He writes, There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. These are games one must first answer. And if it is true, as Nietzsche claims, that a philosopher, to deserve our respect, must preach by example, you can appreciate the importance of the reply, for it will precede the definitive act. These are facts the heart can feel, yet they call for careful study before they become clear to the intellect. Okay, so Albert Camus is essentially asking the reader, hey, is life worth living or not? And if you cannot explain why life is worth living, then you should commit suicide. But I mean, this is a great philosophy book, as, as dour as it seems. I mean, is your life worth living? And if so, what makes life worth living, given giving all the tedious things that we're expected to do? So, Sisyphus. Camus explains the metaphor like this. We're all Sisyphus. We all have boulders that we need to push up the mountain. We all have tedious things that we have to do. This is simply the full catastrophe of our lives. And it's a painful thing. And it's an annoying thing. We all in our lives have our boulders. But in doing these things that life requires of us, there are moments, precious moments, where we get to express ourselves. So we can imagine Sisyphus after the boulder rolls back down and he begins his long journey back down to the base of the mountain. 
of looking up and cursing the gods, of expressing himself freely. As he's pushing his boulder up, there's nothing to stop him from singing a happy song. There are, in other words, moments in life, actual moments in life, where you can find joy. And that is what makes life meaningful. So what made life meaningful for Albert Camus? This is what makes Albert Camus writings, a lot of it, very different from every other philosopher. The only other philosopher who wrote like Albert Camus that I can think of is Michel de Montaigne, the late 16th century French philosopher who lived through um, the period of time of the, of the French uh, wars of religion, uh, the man who coined the term the essay. He wrote a little bit like Albert Camus. They both focused on moments in life that other philosophers just simply wouldn't pay attention to because they were just so seemingly trivial. But for Camus, these are the things that made life worth living. So Camus, growing up in Algeria, loved the Mediterranean Sea. He loved the beach. This photograph here, if you're looking at it, is actually a photograph of Camus. His hand is on the head of his fiance, and he's got two friends that are obviously playing around behind him. Camus loved the Mediterranean Sea. He loved the sun. He loved swimming. And he wrote about these things as if they are the meaning of his life. And in fact, they were. Swimming. Good weather. Friendship. These ordinary things that most people overlook, but are all around each and every one of us. These things contain joy, and these are the things that we should celebrate. Albert Camus was personally, in his writings, uh, just mesmerized by the Mediterranean Sea and the Mediterranean Sun. He, uh, he felt that, historically, he was connected to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans because they were all unified by this same sea and the same... I mean, as he called it, the Mediterranean sun. And he felt a sense of timelessness uh, when he looked out upon the Mediterranean Sea. You know, and he really felt like, you know, these are the, this is the same body of water that the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans sailed. You know, the poet Homer wrote about the Mediterranean Sea. You know, he called the Aegean Sea the wine dark sea. And it's these beautiful little moments in pa that, that, that we have in life that really are worth noticing and celebrating. So as you think about your own life, you know, what are the little things that just provide you with a little bit of respite, peace, happiness, joy? They're probably things that are very unique to you. Uh, like me personally, uh, I love to run. I love to spend time with my wife and my son. Um, I have a particular, uh, on the back of my house, I've got a deck and I love to just sit on my deck and, and read a book and and man, you know, it's moments where, you know, I'm, I'm deep in a run or I'm playing with my son or I'm just chilling out on my back deck reading a book that I just, I, I'm at peace and it's a wonderful moment. But what I say, these things are, you know, what, these things are the meaning of life. I, I don't know. But Camus said they are. And which is why a lot of philosophers do not consider Albert Camus to be really one of the great serious philosophers. But Camus says, no, this is the stuff we should focus on, not the big isms of philosophy. And the reason why is, when we focus on these things, this provides us with a humanity. So if you think of yourself in central Ohio and the little things that make your life joyful, these little things in your life, well, everybody in every culture of every socioeconomic class of every language around the earth has little things like this in their life that make their life joyful. And when you acknowledge this, this connects you with the greater whole of humanity. The big philosophies, the big religions, the isms, those unite you with some, but divide you from others. And this is core to the philosophy of Albert Camus. Okay, I told you Camus is difficult for me to explain. All right, after the war, how does Camus make his money? Uh, as a playwright, he got in the theater and he produced plays. He's also a novelist uh, and he's famous for his novels. So he was a French celebrity. Uh, he's one of those guys you might see in the, the cafes with Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, the three of them were friends. 
or at least for a little while they were friends. And so because he was a, a celebrity, he actually did uh, commercial spots uh, for his uh, on, on French television for his theater. And this for me is bizarre. One of the great intellectuals of 20th century history doing t- commercials where he just walks out and says, hey, bonjour, je m'appelle Albert Camus, come to my theater. <laughs> but he did that. He also had his own newspaper. His newspaper was called Combat, and it came out of the French Resistance. All right. Perhaps the most famous book that deals with the idea of absurdity, even more popular than the philosophy treatise, The Myth of Sisyphus, is this short novel. It's called L'Etranger. It is usually translated into English as The Stranger, although if you go to Britain there, it's usually translated as The Outsider. This is a book that actually came out of a conversation that Camus had with a buddy of his, in which his friend said to Albert Camus, you know, society will kill any man who doesn't cry at his own mother's funeral. And that idea sparked something in Albert Camus, and he eventually dedicates a whole, no- a whole novel to it. A man who doesn't follow the norms of society, society will completely reject the individual. So this is the story of the stranger. Um, the principal character, the protagonist, is a man by the name of Marceau. And uh, the beginning, the page one of the stranger is Marceau getting a telegram that his mom has died and that uh, the funeral is going to be held on a particular day. And he shows no emotion. Uh, The book takes place in Algeria, uh, where the man travels to uh, his mother's funeral. And as you turn the pages in this book, you start to get really annoyed with this guy. You start to hate this guy. Or at least that's that was my response. And I think most readers response to this book, you just you're like, come on, have 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 a feeling here. And then the man ends up on the beach, looking out at the sea, looking up at the Mediterranean sun. It's very Albert Camus-like. But he finds himself in a confrontation with an Arab man. And Marceau ends up shooting the Arab. He kills him. And when he kills him, Marceau just dwells upon how interesting it was to feel the gun kick in his hand as he fired the shot. So you've got this principal character who really just doesn't seem to have any emotion. And people hate him. But here's what makes this novel really complex. Here's a guy who you don't really like, but at the same time, he's also misunderstood by society. He doesn't really have any close friends in the novel. He doesn't feel understood by other people. And don't we all feel that way to a certain extent? And so Camus with Marceau presents to us this incredible uh, character where you don't like him, but at the same time you empathize with him. And uh, so just like Camus' philosophy as a whole, L'Etranger, The Stranger, is a very difficult book to explain and to understand, but it's very emotionally intriguing. And because it's such a relatively short book, it's uh, still frequently taught in a lot of schools today. All right. All right, so here's one of Camus' big philosophy books, much more extensive than uh, The Myth of Sisyphus, The Rebel, uh, originally published in French as L'Homme Revolté, Man in Revolt, is an exploration of ideologies. Camus came out of World War II, and he perceived World War II as this awful cataclysmic event that happened because people had embraced ideologies. So in particular, Nazism, anti-Semitism, communism. He, he was very critical of people who said, okay, that ideology is an ideology I'm going to embrace. Now Camus said, what happens when you embrace this ideology and you say, okay, this is right and everything else is wrong. Then you put yourself on the path to being able to kill in good conscience. So like, just like the Nazi armies that were going into Eastern Europe that I talked about last week, you know, they were able to slaughter Jews and communists and not think anything of it. They, they didn't care because they were Jews and communists. Therefore, they were wrong. And Camus warns us that this can happen if we embrace any ideology. 
So Camus the Rebel, let me just start off with uh, a, a passage from the first page here. Camus the Rebel, he starts off by saying, there are crimes of passion and crimes of logic. The line that divides them is not clear. We are living in the age of premeditation and the perfect crimes. Our criminals are not helpless children. They are adults and they have the perfect alibi, philosophy, which can be used for anything, even for transforming murderers into judges. So in other words, there's people in, in the 20th century who adapt Nazism or, or adopt Nazism as a philosophy. They, they adopt communism as a philosophy and are like, okay, our way is the right way and we're going to kill anybody who doesn't agree with us. And they don't think of themselves as killers. They think of themselves as good people trying to bring about a better world based upon an ideology. So Camus warns us about embracing an ism, about embracing an ideology. Think about this in terms of today in the United States of America embracing um, a political ideology or embracing a religion. Now, I know as I talk about religion and politics, I'm on thin ice here with probably a lot of people, but this is really the only way I know how to apply Camus to today's society. Once you embrace a particular ideology, then that unites you in a family-like way with other people who subscribe to that ideology. You're, you're a family, you're and, and you're going to support each other. And you're right. But it also divides you from other people. And in fact, might make them clear enemies. When otherwise, you'd have absolutely no problem with each other. But because they're on the opposite side of the political spectrum, or because uh, they embrace a different religion, and you both think the other is going to hell, then that divides you from humanity. And for Camus, that's the first step. That's the first step to being able to participate in a genocide in good conscience. So Camus, in the book The Rebel, celebrates, go figure, rebels. So he defines a rebel as an individual who refuses to subscribe to an ideology. And so he says, as I quote him, what is a rebel? A person who says no. But this refusal does not re imply a renunciation. This is also a person who says yes as soon as he begins to think for himself. So when you rebel, you say, no, I'm not going to do something. I'm not going to behave in a particular way. But that's not a renunciation. That's not a giving up. What's contained in your rebellion is an affirmation for your independent self. Now, what Camus does in The Rebel is explore what that independent self is. And if you ever read The Rebel, uh, the last chapter is a rather short chapter, and it's very eloquent about how you embrace your humanity. And when you say, no, I'm an individual, I have hopes, loves, wants, desires, needs, and everything, then you have to acknowledge that in every other human being on earth. And that makes you a humanitarian, but you have to embrace that rebellion in an authentic way. So that's Camus the Rebel. Hey, for what it's worth, this is also a little bit of a history book too. Camus talks about the French Revolution a lot in this book. And he talks about how, you know, there's people uh, who started the French Revolution who ended up wheeling out the guillotine. And, he, and for him, he wants to explain how can people go from embracing freedom for all people and the French Revolution to, hey, let's kill all these people. And he does that with the French Revolution, and he also does it with the Russian Revolution, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. And he talks about those people as being inauthentic rebels, how you can't just rebel and say, I want my freedom, but we're going to still kill anybody else who doesn't agree with us. And for him, you know, you have to get rid of the ism. You have to break from the ideology. Now, some people think that's not a very practical philosophy. It might be good for an individual, but you can't win revolutions with this hyper-democratic, hyper-humanitarian attitude. But for Camus in the 20th century, he felt like this is this humanitarian attitude is the only thing that's going to save humanity right now. Uh, one of the persons who strongly disagreed with Albert Camus with his, was one of his personal friends, Jean-Paul Sartre. Here's a photograph of the two of them together at a party. Sartre's to the left, Camus to the right. And uh, Sartre, uh, when he found out that Stalin had committed atrocities in the Soviet Union, said, I don't want this published in my newspaper because this will dishearten people from communism and we want people to continue to support communism. So we're not, 
we're only going to tell half-truths about Stalin. And Camus strongly disagreed with him on this point. It's like, no, you can't embrace communism just for the sake of communism. It, it divides people. We have to tell the truth. And then the nail in the coffin for their friendship was uh, in, the country, when, in 1956 in the country of Hungary, uh, there was an anti-communist revolt that was violently uh, suppressed by the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact. And Sartre uh, was supportive of the oppression of the revolt in Hungary in 56. And Albert Camus was devastated by it. It's like, no, this is awful what's happening to people there. And the fact that they couldn't agree with on, on the Hungarian Revolution of 56, the failed Hungarian Revolution of 56, uh, these guys, they broke off their friendship because of it. For Camus, never let an ideology destroy your humanity. All right. And the last book I'm going to talk about in this very long lecture on 20th century existentialism is one that I present with a great deal of delicacy, given the current situation in the United States and in the world in April of 2020. But this book is a book that I personally have been thinking a lot about in recent weeks. It was a book that Albert Camus did a whole lot of research to write. And it is also, for me, the greatest book that he ever wrote. Uh, it is not a traditional work of philosophy. This is a novel published in France in 1947 at the end of World War II, or right after World War II. Uh, it, this is La Peste, which is translated into English as The Plague. Here is what The Plague is about. It takes place in the coastal city of Oran, Algeria, a city that Camus describes as a boring and ugly city where most of the people are just concerned with making money but that life has an air of normalcy about it until rats start showing up. Rats start climbing out of sewers and dying on the streets and people are dumbfounded by all of these rats that are lying around. The protagonist of this book is a doctor. This doctor's name is Dr. Ryu. And Dr. Ryu sees the rats and realizes these rats are carrying a disease a viral infection that will most likely begin infecting the human population. And sure enough, he's right. It starts off with just a few dozen deaths, and then it grows to some several hundred deaths every day. Dr. Ryu is the first to proclaim that this is a plague. Camus did a lot of research in order to write this book. He was very fascinated with great plagues in history, uh, including the 1348 Black Death, in terms of how people respond uh, psychologically and emotionally to a viral infection that cannot be cured and spreads throughout a population. Camus spent his whole life in, in, in the shadow of tuberculosis and the threat of death, and he wondered what would it be like if an entire town had to deal with this. The beginning of the outbreak of the plague, with the exception of Dr. Ryu, most people just choose to deny it. This really can't be the plague. They accuse Dr. Yu of fear-mongering. They say that we are a modern Western town. There are no plagues anymore. Plagues are the thing of the past. We've developed. We've evolved. Things have gotten better. Dr. Yu encourages the restaurants to shut down, for people to stop gathering together in places. At first he's ignored. Then when the deaths start mounting, Oran, Algeria turns into a ghost town. People fearful even to open their blinds. And the kind of fundamental philosophical question that goes throughout this entire book is, well, how do you live now? What's right? What's wrong? What's ethical? There's an interesting character in this book who's a journalist from Paris who happened to be visiting Oran when the plague broke out. And Oran gets quarantined, and there's military guards that won't let anybody uh, out of Oran, either by ship or by land. And this, and this, uh, journalist desperately wants to go home to Paris. He's got a family back in Paris. He's got a wife back in Paris. And he's trying to bribe the guards and everything to get him out because he just wants to go home, just get out of this place. And he can't get out. And he goes through this transformative experience of once he realizes he can't escape, once he, once he, sorry about that, once he realizes he can't escape, he decides that he wants to be the best person he can be and, and join the doctor and help the doctor. 
and the two actually end up forming a friendship. Now, somebody who the doctor does not form a friendship with is a particular minister in the book. And this minister says, well, the plague is striking our town because of wrongdoings and sinful living that's been going on here. So he tries to make meaning out of the plague. And Ryu combats him saying, no, sinful living has nothing to do with this. Death is striking at random. We don't know who's going to live. We don't know who's going to die. And it doesn't matter what your faith is or your social class. It's going to hit everybody or not everybody, but it's going to hit all groups of people. And good people are going to die as well as bad people are going to die. So in other words, the situation is fundamentally absurd. There's a meaninglessness in it. Now, how you cope with the meaninglessness? Well, Dr. Ryu turns this over in his mind. And in a relatively famous passage in the book, he talks about how you fight the plague through decency. You be a decent human being. You do your best to care for people in whatever way you possibly can. Be decent. Another way that uh, Ryu combats or how he, how he deals with uh, the, this, the plague and how he finds meaning in his own life is he doesn't deny himself simple joys. And this is also very Albert Camus-like. So Dr. Yu will go swimming. He will go out into the Mediterranean and he'll swim. And he'll just have these moments of joy where he feels the sun, feels the water, feels the sand in between his toes. And he feels that joy. He's like, yeah, this is it. This is what makes life wonderful. For, you, for the doctor, for Dr. Yu, uh, being a decent human being for him meant doing his job. And so he simply, you know, sort of puts his head down and doesn't matter who's sick. He goes in, he helps them. And then eventually, after a period of time, the plague lifts, the quarantine lifts. And there is this exaltation at the end of the book. Life is going back to normal. Life is returning back to normal. We've made it. We've survived it. Now, thank goodness, life can go back to normal. But at the end of the book, Ryu doesn't feel anything can go back to normal ever again. A virus will go away for a period of time, but it will always come back. And death, in all its many forms, is always around us. It can take us at any moment. So once you know that, and you fully embrace that, how do you live your life? For you, the plague is always present. For Albert Camus, tuberculosis was always present. So how do you live your life? You be a decent human being. Now, the last thing I'll say about the plague is it's written in this interesting way where from time to time, just at brief moments, the subject of voice appears. You realize that this book is being narrated and it's not being narrated by the doctor because the doctor is a character who's being described in the narration. So who this I is who's narrating it appears at the very end of the book which makes it kind of a, a clever literary technique. I am not going to disclose who the I is in this book, but that's it. It was for mostly the plague and um, the, the stranger that Albert Camus won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the year 1960. Uh, he did get to go to Stockholm to receive the prize, but sadly it was later on that year where he was uh, killed in an automobile accident. Albert Camus was not driving the car. In fact, it's a rather sad story. He had a train ticket to uh, go back to his home and uh, his, he saw a friend. His friend offered to give him a ride. And so uh, Camus said, yeah, sure, I'd love to hang out with you. So he hops in the backseat of his car, of Buddy's car, and then the car ends up crashing. And killing one of the great literary figures of the 20th century. And in his briefcase at the time, Albert Camus was carrying a manuscript that was uh, about a novel. Well, it was a novel with that was mostly autobiographical about growing up poor in Algeria. Uh, it, the, the novel was going to be called The First Man, Le Premier Homme in French. And the family did not want it published because it was in such a raw form. But finally, uh, Camus' daughter edited it, and it became public. It was published in the year uh, 1996. That was the life of Albert Camus. The last image I have for you on this slideshow here is is this. 
I am sad I have to show it to you in this format because I always like showing it to you guys in class and asking uh, you to look at it and say, and, and, and see if you can identify where this particular image is from. Do any of you recognize it? You see here that it is a bench. I intentionally took a picture of this bench in the winter time because I thought it was appropriate to take a picture of this bench in the winter time, because it is a quote, as you see, from Albert Camus, and it says, "In the depths of winter, I finally learn that within me there lay an invincible summer." A great quote that I think really reflects the spirit of his philosophical work, the Rebel, and his literary work, the Plague. That when times get tough you find out who you really are and that you have within you a fighting spirit. You have within you an invincible summer. So anyways, I always like to ask students, hey, do you, do you recognize where this bench, uh, where, where this branch is from? Uh, I took this picture from somewhere in Upper Arlington. You have most likely passed by this bench and I'm curious if any of you recognize it and know where it's from. So if you think you know where it's from, let me know, shoot me an email and then um, I'll disclose the location of this, uh, of this bench uh, at some future time. I know you're all so excited to know where this is from. Okay, that's it, guys. Hey, this was a long lecture on a lot of philosophy, but I hope you got into it a little bit. Hope you enjoyed it. And I will talk to you next time. Have a great day, Eurobears. Bears.